Okay, so welcome to our third one of these video lectures. This one is going to talk us through the basic models of motor learning stages and how someone progresses from beginner through to expert. And I'm going to call them models rather than theories because they're descriptive. They're just saying here are some stages and here are the contents of those stages of learning. So you can recognize the stages and the patterns and you can perhaps classify people into those patterns. And that tells us perhaps how best to teach the people. But they're probably not quite theories because theories offer some explanation and mechanisms and these are mainly descriptive. So explanation is a bit more than description. So if you're able after this to understand the basic models, and we'll focus on one mainly, uh, it be able to indicate how you'd recognize someone at a different stage and classify someone into those stages, that's pretty good. If you can then pair that to how best to teach the people at each stage, that should be ideal, basically. Of course, we should follow it up with justification and explanation, and that's where you'll have to do a bit of extra work and reading to show that you actually understand you know, why we're making these decisions and not just following instructions. But that's what's higher about higher education. So if we revise briefly what's happening when we're learning, the core issue is that you know, there's some sort of practice taking place and the nature of that practice will vary and we'll discuss that in some future talks. But for the main part, it's the doing something and then receiving the feedback. And as we've discussed in our previous talk, a big important part of that is the trial and error process. So things that appear to work will be reinforced and will carry on and things that don't seem to work should vanish and uh, be extinguished is the word. So if we're doing it wrong, we learn from mistakes and we stop doing it. Uh, and if we're doing it right, that's great, let's stick with it. So in a very simplistic sense, doing something and getting feedback is the learning process. However, what you'll see is that what you're doing should change depending how far you are through the learning process. And even on top of that, in our future talks, we'll look at how you can vary what's being done to perhaps maximize the, the learning. So what you're going to see is a couple of models that describe a very similar process. On the left hand side we have the description of a novice learner and on the right hand side the description of someone we'd consider an expert. You'll see there are no uh, references on this slide because uh, this is just the overall pattern that is kind of my own summary of what you're about to see. Novices, as we've already mentioned before, are quite inaccurate and inconsistent um, because they're beginners and we couldn't expect them to be good or consistent yet. Also, it requires a lot of mental attention and effort to actually produce a movement as a beginner because you have to really devote some thought to how will this feel, how will it look, what should I do and how should I do it. Uh, and so it's quite uh, dominating, it just takes over your thought process to a large extent. Uh, because you haven't got any understanding of how it should feel or look or you know how best to generate that outcome. And that's why the outcomes you're producing are very inconsistent. Because it's so demanding mentally, and because our mental processing is quite limited in terms of how much it can do at once, what we see is quite stiff and rigid movements. So you can do some very clever stuff. You can work out how to produce a new movement for the first time. That's very sophisticated, but you have to be you have to do it slowly, and that's the kind of limitation of our cerebral cortex. It's brilliant, but it has to be a little bit slower. The outcome, in the end, is to make it automatic further down the line. Because you're limited in how much you can do at once, to, to have an attempt, we do something called freezing the degrees of freedom. So you think about the action of throwing a ball, there's all number of moving parts. Um, you know, let's not forget that you're connected to the ground, so that is you know, the anchor from which the movement begins. And then there's all kind of rotation and the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and even the fingers all kind of participate in projecting that ball forwards. And they can't, if you've got a limited bandwidth, you can't have all of those being thought about at once. So we will freeze aspects of it and just do the bare minimum just to attempt the outcome. And as we get the hang of it, will free up the degrees of freedom and allow more and more moving parts into our equation. So a good way of thinking about this is to compare how you would throw an object 
with your bad hand versus how you throw it with your good hand. And you'll notice quite quickly that you're kind of more stiff and rigid with your bad hand and there's less moving parts. And it just kind of, to most people you'd say it looks a bit wrong, but you have a go. Versus with your good hand, it's much more fluid. Everything is kind of coiled and springy and everything's flexed the right time and the right way. And therefore, it's a better outcome, more consistent. And the difference is you've got more degrees of freedom and more flexibility and fluidity when you're very well practiced and good. And when you're starting out, you have to keep certain parts of your body still just to be able to process that information. What that then means is that it's quite energy expensive because you've got some muscles that are flexed to keep you still, you've got some muscles that are tense and you're pulling against them as you're trying to move the other muscles, so it's very inefficient. And of course, in, by the end, you become extremely efficient and only use minimum amount of energy to generate the outcome. There's no wasted effort. So on the other side of the screen, you'll see experts, of course, by definition, are very accurate and therefore very consistent. What, one of the key properties you see is that it's automatic and there's very little thought required. In fact, they can think about other stuff whilst they're producing these seemingly very sophisticated movements. When required, an expert can show quite a complex understanding of the task, uh, but obviously the whole point of making it automated is that you haven't got to think about it while you're doing it. So usually, making someone think about the movement while they're doing it will make them look less good again, because that again you go back to having a limited capacity. So a lot of the best movements are actually done with very little cognitive regulation. It should look relaxed and flowing and smooth because it's all the rigidity of having to freeze degrees of freedom is not the case. You, you've got it all under control and you can relax. And that should make it very energy efficient. There's not an ounce of wasted effort. If you need to produce a maximal effort, you can, as opposed to putting against tense muscles. So everything's kind of perfect in that situation. And importantly, there's no mental effort required. So what you see here is there's at least four descriptive models of these different stages, and perhaps the most popular is the Fitz and Posner um, at the top there, and you'll see that there are three others that have come along afterwards. And so if you want to, for example, try and develop your analysis and critical thinking, you could try and ask, well, what's different about the ones that have come along afterwards, and are they better? Because if they've come along afterwards, you'd imagine they're meant to be improvements, and yet actually Fitz and Posner has stuck around. Is it just that it happened to get there first? Is it more intuitive? Which sometimes happens. You know, are these subsequent models actually better? And if you're able to talk about in the, you know, this topic in those terms, the chances are you're doing very well and actually quite sensitive to the differences and the key debates in the area. But even just you know, going through these now is sufficient knowledge to get you through. So the Fitz and Posner model begins with what they call a cognitive stage because you have to think cognitively about the movement. And then as you've constructed these movement patterns, you begin to associate the movement that you're capable of with the outcome that you're trying to generate. So if the situation changes or the nature of the task changes, you're able to say, well, I have this movement I can do and I can associate that. So it's beginning to make the links from the environment to your own capacity. Moving through to an autonomous stage, where it should be very automatic and, and you've freed up that precious resource of thinking to do other stuff, to think perhaps about tactics or just more important issues than movement. Adams's model gives different labels to very similar concepts. So Adams focused on the idea of there being a verbal stage because in addition to being cognitive, Adams reasoned that it was actually verbal, you're talking yourself through the movement. And in some ways, again, uh, verbal reasoning is limited to, you know, there's so much you can say linguistically at any one time, whereas there's a whole bunch of other ways of expressing information. You know, people often say that body language conveys much more information than the words alone. This, you know, is a, it's a nice metaphor for why it's limited. There's only so much information that can be reasoned through verbally at a time. And then as you progress through Adam's model, by the end you would say, okay, you've gone from being verbal motor to just pure motor. So all controlled and regulated in a, in a motor sense without any need to think about it or reason through it. 
Gentile uses a more kind of intuitive uh, terminology, it's talking about getting the idea of the movement, just somehow getting to grips with it and having some representation in mind of how that movement should look and feel. And then by the time you're good, it talks about it being fixated or fixed, you know, it's pretty consistent now, it can do it regularly. And importantly, you can diversify the movement, so you can take it between contexts and situations and actually still succeed. And that's an important part of our definition of a skill from the previous talk, is that it's transferable, it's not just limited to that one moment or that one space. Newell talks about there being a coordination phase where you gradually build up some ability to coordinate the, the movement itself, then a phase where you've actually gained control and you can you know, produce the outcomes reasonably well to the point where it becomes a skill and it's transferable and you can do it consistently and regularly and adapt to different contexts. So we're going to flesh out this basic idea in the next couple of slides and then we're going to try and associate how that would affect what you do with different people at different stages. So we've got on the left hand side the Fitz and Posner, on the right hand side the Newell. And you should see some consistency. There should be yeah, a decent amount of overlap in these descriptions. But the Fitz and Posner approach focuses on the cognitive demands, the high mental demands to actually analyse and think about the movement. And that includes some verbal reasoning, some logic. And of course the coach should be able to inform that and steer that with the right ideas, for example. Very demanding on attention, you probably can't think about much else when you're learning a skill for the first time, a movement. Um, and the areas you'll see will be um, quite big and quite frequent. But, and you should observe this by the way in our mirror drawing lab, you should see that the improvement is very rapid and, uh, and gross, so very big improvements, quick and big improvements. In the Newell model we talk about the degrees of freedom idea that I've mentioned. So you have to freeze the degrees of freedom because you can only think about so many moving parts at once. Uh, and we constrain many parts of them, what's possible, just to, just to have a go and collect some information that will then inform our subsequent movement pattern. And we're gradually constructing this action system. At the next stage you're associative and that means that the movements are becoming refined, less requirement to think about it yeah, analytically or verbally. The person can actually detect errors and they can start to you'll start hearing them saying, now I'm doing this wrong or that, that would have been wrong. Or at least I did that wrong and I can know what to do next time to make it better. The patterns themselves should be fairly consistent by now. And so that should produce fewer errors and smaller errors. And I think at the core, you know, you're associating what I'm capable of with what's being asked of me, so you're associating. Uh, in the Newell's model, he talks about degrees of freedom being released, up, and so you start to become more fluid in the movement and more moving parts are involved. And there's this idea that the parameters of the movement start to become better understood. So the parameters, in a, in a sort of simplistic sense, we could say, okay, how much force is required, how much speed is required, um, what directions do each part have to move in to achieve this outcome. So the sort of basic physical parameters become understood and you can start to vary those parameters to produce different outcomes. So the idea of parameters is, is an important aspect of how we try and analyse and talk about people's learning and improving. And obviously talking about it is quite clunky and ugly and yet when the person's learning it they intuitively seem to understand what's required and how to change their movement accordingly. So it's again really important that when we talk about it, it might be linguistically a bit tricky, but actually what we want the person learning the movement to do is to produce this intuitive uh, understanding that doesn't require too much thinking or any thinking actually. That last point there is that what you again talking about being associative what you're capable of doing becomes linked to your perception. So you're able to see different task requirements and adapt your movement. So that linkage becomes smoother and smoother and quicker and quicker. You can easily say, I know exactly what's required here and I can do it. 
So when you can achieve that, your movement becomes autonomous. Very little attention is required. You can not only detect errors um, afterwards, but even during, and sometimes correct them before they've occurred. That should lead to very few errors, and so your attention is freely up to think about other stuff. Of course, in many sports, that's really important that you can execute a skill whilst also thinking about tactics and positioning and things. But historically, that's a really important aspect of, of just being a human being, that we aren't consumed by thinking about simple aspects of movement. We're able to plan around that and, and think ahead. Or even sometimes, you know, that, that thinking capacity is extremely precious and we shouldn't be devoting it to you know, just moving. We should, it's, it's useful for other stuff and we should be able to free it up so that we can think whilst moving. In the Newell approach we talk about, okay, now the perfect values, the perfect understanding is achieved with the parameters of the, of the movement. So when a new task is experienced, you're completely able to adapt and change your movement to incorporate that. And you also start to get an understanding of what they call passive and reactive forces. So again, just the idea of uh, how you connect to the ground it talks about you know, reaction forces and you know, Newton's laws of motion, every force has an equal and opposite. So you start to get an idea of how objects might bounce off other objects, how you might be able to use leverage, how you would uh, adapt to different playing surfaces and different friction levels. So you get an idea of how these forces are useful or um, damaging and, and again you can adapt. So if you spend a few extra seconds just really fleshing out um, these stages, sticking with Fitz and Posner now, because that seems to be a very popular uh, approach. At that initial stage, the person will be very focused on, well, what am I even trying to do here? How do I do it? How do I hold the tools, the racket or the club or whatever? Um, how far, how fast, how do I, you know, just literally from the beginning, in a very basic sense. Very attention demanding, you know, easily should occupy most of our thinking capacity it depends on good feedback and we could leave that feedback to be just the outcome of the movement but it might be that they're not very good so that's quite demotivating uh, they'll sh you should observe quite a lot of verbalization just because people are thinking things through and reasoning things through um, maybe not necessary but certainly typical people just tend to talk about it quite a lot even internally, that internal voice. You should see some pretty big errors, some pretty frequent errors, and that's fine, they're a beginner. And you know, the movement is very variable. They haven't got any consistent movement pattern yet. And because they're freezing the degrees of freedom, you should see this awkward, stiff, rigid movement. But as they progress, it should become more and more fluid. So in the second stage, intermediate stage, or the associative stage, to use its sort of correct term, People can associate what's required with what they're capable of and that's really important because that sort of begins the shortcut process between simply seeing it and doing it without having to think and reason. Because you've developed these consistent movement patterns, the number of errors reduce and they become smaller because you've got something reliable to draw from and therefore the amount of thinking and reasoning becomes reduced because you've got what you might call off-the-shelf motor programs that you can just call into action. I've developed this over time, I know it's pretty close to what I need, I'll use that and work around it. That therefore means that the person has some ability to detect errors because they've got an understanding of the movement so they can start to change the parameters and how much force or how quick certain parts of it are executed. And that involves knowledge of performance so the person can actually talk about the movement and talk about how it might produce different outcomes or be done different ways. Overall, the variability, the consistency would have improved, the variability would have reduced, and you know people should be producing a pretty consistent pattern of movement. Maybe they're not perfect yet, but if you look at them without seeing the outcome, you'll see a pretty consistent pattern being produced. And then once someone's very good at the movement, you should see very little mental effort, very little conscious control going in, very little verbal reasoning because it should be a simple connection between the environmental demands and I know exactly what to do and I haven't got to think about it. It's almost just a pairing up process.
The attention therefore is freed up to do other stuff, which is really important because we only have one sort of sophisticated processor and it's just too important to use up moving all the time. So you can think about tactics, you can think about strategy, or you can just think about what's for dinner that night. And the person is capable of very sophisticated analysis of their self or others. However, you probably don't want people to be thinking about the movement while they're doing it because that would almost take them back a little bit towards being a cognitive verbal learner. So while they're capable of it, you wouldn't want that to happen during the production of the movement. By this stage, the consistency should be very good and very little variability and therefore very few errors and any errors that do occur should be small. So you could view it as quite rare to reach this stage, although you know, in some respects you can say we're all um, autonomous in some capacity. Again, we all walk around and climb stairs very efficiently, but equally, you know, we've all progressed from being poor drivers to good drivers within our adult lives. Uh, you know, we went from having to think about it extremely hard to finding it extremely easy, and we can now think about our route or what to put on the radio, and the actual movement aspects are kind of under control. But you can be thrown back into having to think about it again, for example, by changing to a different car or getting into a van or using an automatic for a while and going back to a manual. And you can experience that feeling of having to go back and think again before it's automated. So on the one hand, you can say it's a time thing. The more practice that occurs, the further you'll get through this learning spectrum. On the other hand, of course, that isn't all of it. So you can also think about how we might vary practice, how we might vary the feedback, uh, you know, and that should lead to different outcomes. Sometimes if you practice one aspect of a skill lots, you'll learn to do that really well, but you can't vary it. So you've got quick learning, but not very deep learning. Equally, if you do try and pursue deep learning by varying the, ne the execution quite a lot, the person will improve much more slowly, but they should have a much more sophisticated understanding of the task and therefore deeper learning. So the simple equation of time probably isn't quite sufficient and therefore our 10,000 hours rule probably isn't quite describing what goes on. There might be ways of shortcutting it by having optimal practice and optimal feedback. What all that means is that you should therefore have different teaching strategies depending on what stage somebody is at. So if someone's just beginning, you'll need to give them some context and explain not only what to do but why. You know, what are we trying to achieve here? Demonstrations will help, both you know, video or yourself, but even also sometimes physically helping the person be in, hold the things the right way or be in the right position. It's there's going to be a lot of things going wrong with a novice learner, there'll be lots of errors being made, so there's no real benefit in pointing all of that out, you'll just crush their motivation. So where possible it's probably best to focus on the good things. And I've certainly had, you know, for example, a golf coach who would not worry about where the ball was going as long as the, the thing he'd just said to do was being done. Everything else will come into, come into play later on. And that was much more motivating than watching the balls go along the ground and feeling bad. As long as the process is right, as long as you know, I'm focusing on some good things, I'm probably helping this person. Another really important consideration is that we know that their, their bandwidth, their attentional capacity is completely consumed just trying to learn the movement. So there's not a lot of point adding more information you know, into that channel. It will just be lost or you know, confused. So better off, rather than overloading a person with information, we're better off just actually giving them the right information and asking them to focus on a couple of things, but things that we know are really important. And you know, that prioritization and focusing should lead to you know, quicker gains, I guess. So we manage it to make sure that there's smaller amount of information going through and the information that's in that channel is the most appropriate. As I was alluding to a second ago, Focus on the process because the outcomes won't be good yet. So let's just focus on the right technique and worry about the outcomes later on. Once someone's got the basic movement patterns, then we can start to vary things and mix things up. 
so we can make sure it's being done at the right speed and not worrying about slowing it down to make it easier. We can put it into realistic settings and start to you know try and encourage that association between what's being asked of you and what you actually do, forming that association and, and therefore we'd expect much more variability in practice for someone at the associative stage of learning. We actually probably want, bearing in mind we're trying to get them to the point where they're autonomous, we want them to be able to self-analyse. So whereas in the beginning stage we would have given them more guidance, not a lot of guidance because they've got a limited ability to think, however we we'll give them more guidance at that first stage, where now we're actually trying to encourage self-analysis, which could be explicit. What do you think happened there? How would you do it differently next time? Or it could be something where you just don't volunteer the information as quickly. So, you know, because some coaches want to just, every execution of a skill, just give you information. Maybe sit back, maybe delay, maybe give less frequent feedback. Um, but the idea is knowing the endpoint is autonomous, I need to remove my support and encourage the person to think for themselves. We don't want to create an athlete or a learner who, every time they experience a problem, turns around and says, tell me what to do, boss. So, yeah, managing that instinct to correct and help may actually be better in the long term. Once you've got someone who's quite autonomous, you shouldn't have to help too much. Um, less intervention, more just a matter of setting up the practices that we know will maintain the skills. Of course, you know, motivationally we can ask them to push themselves and set new goals, but actually just because someone is autonomous doesn't mean that they're necessarily perfect. They could be autonomously doing something uh, which isn't brilliant, isn't the best in the world. So there's still scope to make little changes and the pattern will be that you do require the person to think about those changes so they kind of progress back a little bit to thinking about it again and then hopefully you're able to automate those improvements so they become the new technique, the new automatic first option. And that's really hard by the way because they're doing something automatically by now so you have to physically cue them and constantly remind them somehow that you're trying to do this new thing, don't forget this is going to be better in the future. But certainly we shouldn't assume that learning is stopped just because it's become autonomous. And that point of practice to maintain, you know, now we just need to make sure that the person remains capable of producing these skills in different situations, in different demands, different environments, whatever it might be. And of course if the level of, of competition goes up, they may have to somehow make sure that they're practicing for that new level of demand as well. So this is a summary straight from the textbook and again we're talking about theoretical depictions but actually it's more about a model, it's more about a representation, a classification system, it doesn't explain to us how these changes are occurring mechanically. Which is fine, the model as we've just seen makes useful suggestions on how to help but if you wanted to dig deeper into the mechanisms of what's going on underneath then we'd have a theory. So we've got the, the basic references there, you know, classic references that will just be easily looked up, but the overall pattern is described in these three columns. And hopefully that's what you've got quite clearly now. There should be no surprises in, in there at all off the last 20 minutes or so of me talking. If and when you choose to go and read a bit further, all the textbooks will have content on this. Uh, so whichever one you happen to be able to get your hands on, Click to the index, and sure enough, there'll be content there on Fitz and Posner and the rest. For now, though, that's it. See you soon.